Hi. Nice crowd. Thank you all for making time for this. I know you've all got other stuff you could be doing, and it's wonderful to see you here. May have something to do with him over there, but I prefer to think you just love the tech. So it is lovely to have you here. Uh, we do have a couple more Star Wars events coming up, by the way, including the Star Wars women. Kim Smith and Carol Bauman will be here to discuss their work on Star Wars. Don Beast is coming up as well. That's uh, January 19th for Don, and the Star Wars women is coming up February 16th, so it'd be great to see you all for that. We have a slightly different procedure for questions today. I know some of you regulars are used to holding up your question because there are so many of you and we don't want to disrupt the flow. If you have a question at any point for Lauren today, just wander back to where David's sitting there at the desk, consider him our receptionist, <laughs> and there's a sheet of paper and there are pens there and you can write out any questions. We've got a presentation up front for Lauren. He's gonna be doing a little bit of chatting and then when he and I start doing a Q&A, we'll integrate as many of your questions as you can. And to accommodate those, I'd ask you to try to avoid writing speeches and keep your questions as concise as you can so we can try to get everybody in there. You know who Lauren is or you wouldn't be here, but for those who got dragged along, he's a visual effects artist who's well known for his works on Star Wars and for his book in 2006, Sculpting a Galaxy Inside the Star Wars Model Shop. He earned a bachelor's in art from Cal State Long Beach, and he's worked on many of George Lucas's film. We'll hear some about those today. It's gonna to be a lovely meandering conversation. Let me ask you, if you do care to leave early for whatever reason, please don't go through these doors. Go to the back and there's an exit where you can leave more quietly and less obtrusively, okay? So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Lauren Peterson. Big crowd, huh? Um, either um, either you've all got your Christmas shopping done, or Star Wars uh, ILM is a really big draw. Either one of those two. <laughs> <clears throat> now, um, also in the in the audience, actually, there's a couple of uh, people that I worked with all of those years on the Star Wars series. So they're gonna be uh, keeping me honest about all this stuff. If you hear any groans or things like that, they say, oh, it wasn't done that way, or that kind of thing. And also, uh, believe it or not, it's been f almost 40 years since we started the first Star Wars. Uh, you know, probably half the audience isn't even 40 yet. But, uh, so it's a pretty enduring uh, uh, story um, that, uh, that George Lucas came up with. Um, and, for, and 40 years ago, I, I, I kind of wanted to, uh, exp I was thinking about this on the way down here, that uh, how chance has an awful lot to, to play in uh, what your role in life is. Yes, you prepare yourself for different things, but uh, like, like me, originally, I was just hired for two months to do uh, the Death Star specifically. And the reason I was hired to do the Death Star is because it involved a lot of work on your knees and the other model makers, I think, uh, got tired of working on their knees all every day, and so they hired a new guy, which was, was me. <laughs> new guy. Um, I, I was a model maker at that time, though. I'd studied art in school and, and uh, worked as an industrial design model maker. But um, I, I, one of the guys here that I worked with pointed out, he thought one of the days he knew that I was gonna be staying longer than two months, and that was, believe it or not, I knew about super glue, and they didn't. <laughs> and um, you have to understand that this is 1975, early 76, when super glue was, uh, you couldn't buy it in stores, you could only buy it at an industrial, uh, for, for, to the trade, in other words. And uh, I noticed how they were working on uh, the princess's ship is what they were doing at the time and they were taking five minute epoxy, mixing it up and sticking on little pieces and putting masking tape across it and then moving to the next one and mixing up five minute epoxy over and over again. And I remember thinking, wow, that, what are they doing? You know, that's, that's crazy that they're doing it that way. So I brought in a bottle of super glue, I put a pencil and cantilever it, cantilever it over the table I put a little drop of super glue on there and I moved my hand and the pencil stayed out, uh, sticking out sideways. And uh, a lot of gasps and it really changed the way models were made. <laughs> so 
chance plays an awful lot uh, in, the, uh, in your role, you know, in life. And um, I, I certainly was lucky. I, and some, I never really say it myself, but I've had other people go, you got to be a kid your whole life, you know, <laughs> for 40 years, longest job I ever had and will ever have, I'm sure. But, but not just a kid, because there are pressures in your business. You, you have pressure in your business. It's, it's not all, oh. all fun and games. You have deadlines. Yeah. You have new things to keep up with. Yes, the, um, the, the film business is definitely uh, profit run. You know, you, you don't make films to, uh, to just to do the exercise. And uh, it's, it's a little, I have a, f a, f a funny, a little bit of a funny story to sell along those lines is, to my parents, I always had a really hard time explaining what I was doing for work. You know, they knew that I could drive a car and put gas in the car and pay for an apartment. But uh, each time I would explain to them what I did, I could just see them kind of glaze over. You know, it was just, uh, it, well, what in the world is that? You know, that wasn't uh, anything they related to. And uh, my mother, on maybe the eighth time she'd asked me what I did, she, uh, she said, well, what are you doing uh, this weekend? And I said, well, I have to work on budgets, you know, for the next year. And she said, oh, you're working on budget. And uh, she, I said, blah, blah, budget, budget, budget. And she said, well, well, how much money are we talking about? And this, granted, was way back in 79, 80. And I said, well, the budget for the model shop for this year will be $1.5 million. And she, she gasped, you know, and just stopped talking. And I realized what she really wanted to do was to get off the phone as quick as possible so that she could run over to the neighbors so she could <laughs> interject the 1.5 million. You know, her son was working on a project uh, that he was working with a budget of 1.5. But uh, right, it is a, uh, it's a serious, it is a money serious business. And uh, kind of an interesting thing is that the first Star Wars took uh, $10.5 million to make. By the time we did uh, Sith, the last one, the model shop's budget was more than that. So it, it's kind of a misconception to think that uh, the models keep going down and down and down in quantity. Uh, example is seven model makers on Star Wars and about 102 on Sith. So there was just a lot more work. That, granted, there were 650 CG artists so uh, our percentage went down, if any, anybody that had the high school math, percentage went down, but our actual numbers went up considerably. Yeah. Well, how do you avoid not being one of the older folks that the young whippersnapper comes to and says, haven't you heard of super glue? Why don't you know about that? I mean, has the table turned a little bit? How do you keep up? Well, um, the whippersnappers. <laughs> um, you know, like I was, I was one of the, I was 29, uh, just turning 30 when I started, and believe it or not, I was, uh, I think, the third oldest. Uh, there were only like three, two or three people older than me. Everybody else was in their 20s from 19 to about 32 years old. Um, uh, then, you know, years go by, you're starting to hire people that are five years younger than you, and then years go by, there's 10 years younger than you, and 15 years, and 20 years, and on down the road. And I, uh, you know, you act, I, I, I got an awful lot of respect for uh, what we did, for not only from the rest of the world, but from the people you work with, and uh, the younger people who start working with you. And I had this, uh, somebody asked me this kind of a question once, and I thought, you know, it's a little bit like, Everybody's going into battle. We're gonna, we got a year and a half to do a project. We're going to finish this film in a year and a half. And um, we're all rushing into battle. We all have our sword in hand. If, if I were to fall to one knee, those people that are 20 years younger than me would help me up, you know. They'd get, rush onto the battle. If I dropped to both knees, they'd still help me up, you know. If I dropped to both knees and dropped my sword, Somebody else, the, the 20 or 30 years younger than me, would pick it up and rush to the front, leaving me on the ground, you know. <laughs> so the object was to never fully fall to your knees. And keep. And I, we must have been performing because uh, it isn't like we got rid of all those people that were been there from the beginning. Uh, there's, there's at least one in the room right now. But... Um, um, uh, you, you, I guess you just keep performing and performing, and uh, <laughs> uh, an old uh, 
film thing is you're only as good as your last screw up, you know, on a project. And uh, if you just keep doing well from one to another, um, you know, if you if you exploded a mountain in one movie, three years later someone will remember you exploded a mountain successfully in one movie, so you'll do it again. Or did a train crash or a boat sink. Um, uh, it, it, oddly enough, the effects business went in these cycles that uh, we, we would notice, like, my God, everybody's having a boat sink, you know, in a movie, like three movies in a row, or uh, everybody's having the planet blow up or something like that. And I do have to say that, um, yes, I, I worked on uh, all the Star Wars and all the Indiana Jones, but uh, ILM as a whole ha did about over 200 films in those 38 some years, 40 years. And me personally uh, worked on about uh, a little under 60, as I remember. So uh, what I'll be showing here is certainly more than just uh, Star Wars. Do you want to swing into that, or should we talk? What's that? Do you want to swing into that, or shall we talk? Yeah, I have a uh, I have what I call a wow reel. It just kind of gets uh, blood flowing, and it's uh, it, it's it's a reel of just shots that really emphasize uh, model work. Uh, so there is yes a little bit of CG in the end. But it's uh, CG augment, augmenting models and that kind of thing. So let's let's try uh, the twelve. The reel is about uh, twelve minutes long or something like that. And I'll make a, a comment maybe once in a while. And the lights will go down. I hope. Uh, as I mentioned there briefly. Um, you know, water, droplets of water are the same size unless you atomize, woo. <laughs> <laughs> Easier to do than say. Right? Easy for me to say, huh? Anyway, that and fire, you just can't make a, you know, a small miniature fire. And on the first Star Wars, we made a lot of desktop models tending to be as big as this table or so. And of course, the time we did Sith, we were starting to do models about half the size of this. Uh, some of the models were about half the size of this room. So uh, it, as, as CG took over the smaller models, we then moved on to more environmental type of models. So uh, we were still ma making models, but a um, few times we were actually making a spaceship that would fit on this table. Can you talk about the learning curve when you're making the choice between what's gonna be CGI, what's going to be a model, what goes into that decision, and what's some of the trial and error that you've, you know, you've learned with? Yeah, usually, uh, the model shop isn't the first group of people that are consulted uh, as to uh, whether or not it's to be CG or model. Um, there is, I, I do remember there was a film called, I think, Jack Frost, uh, uh, not, not so uh, great a film, Christmas film, and I was called into a meeting to see whether or not it would be models or CG, you know, let's talk about it. And I had read the script and I hated it. You know, I just thought this was going to be a big loser. <clears throat> and so I directed all my questions. Every time I was asked about it, I would say, you know, I, I think that this would be better done as a CG uh, show than, uh, <laughs> than model. <laughs> and I won. You know, I won by my defi definition of winning. And um, uh, at other times, you lobby, you, you, you lobby vigorously to try and make it a model uh, rather than the other way around. Because, but sometimes it seems CG is like a wa an inevitable wave that's washing over us uh, uh, over and over again. Uh, there's still a lot, there was still a lot of model work that we did, but uh, of course they got better and better and better and better at what they're doing. Um, an example of that is with the re-release re of Star Wars, uh, you know, George Lucas wanted to take baby steps in, in making CG in his movies, and you got things like the, uh, they're not called dewlaps, they're called uh, some other beast in the background. You know, you guys would, would know. Um, Dewbacks, that's what they're called. And they look, in reality, they look pretty awful when you look at them now. But it was a baby step leading towards better and better and better uh, computer graphics. And uh, which they did. And uh, they came up with amazing things. Um, uh, just, I, I remember uh, the crash of Sebulba, it was one of the crashes in Phantom Menace, and I thought, oh, we should do it as a model because we can have a car, we'll drive a car along an uh, airfield north of us, we'll have the right kind of uh, Fuller's Earth dirt on the ground, we'll air eject the uh, model onto the ground, it'll tumble and break up uh, just like a, a Formula One car would be that crashes, 
and uh, they insisted uh, eventually that it be done CG, and a guy named Habib, Habib Zagapur just did an amazing job uh, at that kind of thing, uh, plotting out the geometry of it, the physics of it, how the weight of each object would spin off. He uh, it, it far, far exceeded anything that I could conceive of uh, being done in computer graphics at the time. So can you pull out some of your most impressive arguments as to why something should be a model instead of CG? When you've really got to sell that point, what do you rely on? Well, what do you rely on when... Um, when you're making your case. You, you know, you're always, uh, you can easily be outvoted, you know, and that, that does happen. Um, but part of when you draw upon your old, uh, older experience, you know, what, what, because we have done nearly 40 years worth of films, and so you can go back and draw upon something and say, oh yeah, you know, when we did this, we did that, and uh, you know, there are a number of times when CG people are really on your side, too, on the model shop side. It's not, uh, uh, everybody doesn't just uh, blindly lobby for their own, their own approach. Um, uh, along, those, along those lines, I, I remember in the model shop, say, separate from CG earlier, I sometimes would tell the model makers, I say, try to, when you're trying to come up with a way of doing something, try to semi-abandon your first idea and come up with a second idea or a third idea because we can become incredibly enamored of that first idea. You think of it as being, oh my God, I'm, I'm brilliant. I just thought of this, you know, <laughs> and you stick with it. Whereas in reality, you might come back to that first solution, but you're, you're better and safer to come up with a second and a third possible way. It makes you modify your thinking a little bit. But um, we, we had to do that quite a bit. Sometimes we would, uh, within the model shop, we would, uh, you know, I'd say, well, how about three different proposals, you know, for uh, the big uh, executor, the big blue ship, you know. What are the three different ways that we could do that? And different model makers would go off and, and pursue the fiberglass one, pursue the honeycombed aluminum one, uh, you know, do the aluminum one, and, uh, and eventually decide on uh, what would be the better solution. But that's within our own group. And, and I have to say about, you know, when we, we all call ourselves model makers, but in reality it had an incredible range of skills. Uh, you know, when there were seven of us, we tended to both make models and paint them and sometimes do the machining, although we had a machine shop. But by the time we reached uh, Sith, uh, there were people that were uh, engineers, uh, people we had, could draw upon, a person who was an optical engineer even, and um, people who had studied chemistry, like John Foreman, uh, art, architecture, uh, literally fine art painting, it and sculpture. It was a whole range of skills. And um, we eventually, uh, it's like, I don't remember myself painting a model in the last 15 years or so in that you had really good painters uh, in your group and so you would say we segmented ourselves a bit uh, but that's some good questions coming in from the audience oh really? uh, here's one I see some of the models seem to use parts from other model kits can you give a sense of the variety of model kits you use to make some of the preps ah yeah some of the variety of models because in the in the first number of years, maybe the first 10 years, we did a lot of kit bashing. And uh, most of you would know what that means, but we would buy high-end model kits and borrow pieces. So like the back end, uh, the engine back end of the Millennium Falcon is just like a mandala made of uh, Formula One cars and uh, Panzer tank wagons, that kind of, uh, that kind of stuff. But uh, the, the best model kits at that time, especially, were made by Hasegawa and Tamiya, uh, two Japanese companies. And uh, there were a couple of others. There was an Italian company, I think, called EPI or something like that, that um, had really good World War II model kits. And you'd have a little bit harder time to, to find them these days, but um, Steve and I would go to a warehouse <clears throat> in Van Nuys, near where we were doing the first show, and have a shopping cart. And it was like the warehouse, and we would just pull off two of this and five of that and ten of this and fill up two shopping carts and head back to the shop. Because um, we always had to have, you had to have right and left of everything. You had to have multiples of everything. So we, we knew, well, it was, it was either 4, 8, 16, 22. It was never seven of anything, in other words. We always had to have uh, matching sides to things. But, 
we, um, that was a really good way of making those model kits, and it, uh, model, models, and it was an extension in a way of George Lucas's phrase from the very beginning was he wanted a used universe. He didn't want uh, like old Flash Gordon movies where everything was nice and shiny and clean and everything. He wanted oil drips and, and looking like maintenance had been delayed or just about to happen or didn't happen, that kind of thing. That um, it, it was a very wise uh, and very human way to, uh, to think of a science fiction film. Uh, just like our, our world, you know, some, uh, your, uh, your faucet on the back of the closet might be dripping, but it's more important to do the kitchen today, you know, the, the kitchen's dripping, and uh, you'll get to the one in the backyard uh, next month, maybe, you know, if possible. And, and the same thing will happen in the future, too. You, you'll never get a, uh, you know, just try to think of everybody, how, you know, how many people in this room's computer is acting up, you know, right now. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure you'd get a certain percentage always happening, the, the computer's acting up. Yeah. This is an interesting one. This is about you personally. Can you talk about your time in Guatemala as a rebel trooper? Ah. <clears throat> yes, um, I was the, the rebel trooper uh, up in a tower on, the, uh, on, a, on a pyramid in Guatemala. And um, of course, there's always longer stories. And I, I, I hope I don't make them too long. But um, the studios, uh, we were almost through making Star Wars. It was, I think, March of 77, and the film was coming out in the summer. And uh, this George wanted, he saw a picture in National Graphics. He said, that's what I want to do uh, in the pyramids in Guatemala for that shot. And the studios at the time, thinking money, 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 you're spending money, money, money. Uh, how about using uh, um, uh, Adventureland in Disneyland? You know, and it was like, <laughs> you know, if you got up high to do a high shot, of course, you'd see the parking lot and the mechanisms, and it was just like the silliest idea in the world you'd ever heard in the world. Um, and if you just wanted a low down shot, you could buy a bunch of tropical plants and do it that way. So um, eventually the studio um, conceded the fact that it just wasn't going to work that way. And so they, they said, we'll only pay for two people to go to Guatemala. And I knew that both of them didn't speak Spanish, and I speak a little bit of Spanish. And so I, it was like, I, I, I volunteered to go. You know, I said, I'll go. I'm not working now. I'm off of the project. And um, th that they wouldn't do that because of insurance purposes and everything. So eventually, I just took it on myself, got a plane ticket, and arrived in Guatemala. And uh, it was fortunate that I did because uh, I think we had something like 13 cases of a camera equipment that all had to be pulled by ropes up the side of the pyramids, which were all covered in jungle. At that time, the jungle was all covering them. They weren't, uh, they weren't empty of, uh, just down to the stone. And then when we got to the top, we built the tower, and they had to have a cameraman, and they had to have a, a machinist, a camera assistant. And uh, eventually they said, well, there has to be somebody in the tower, too, because we brought the costume with us. And I was the only one that didn't have kids of, of, <laughs> of the, uh, the three of us. And it was, uh, it was off, I don't know if you know, but Egyptian pyramids are made at 52 degrees, and uh, uh, you could, uh, Mayan temples are much steeper. And <clears throat> so it was about 300 feet down off the edge of the cliff from where the, uh, the tower was that we placed. So you had to sit up there and wait for it to steady, you know, because you'd get up into it, it would be rocking, and then you'd say, okay, calm down, calm down, calm down, and, until it stopped. But, but that was how I happened to be in that particular shot. And it turns out that um, there's many shots in the Star Wars films, including Indiana Jones films, you know. We need a hand pointing at the book when he's a professor in the library at the Well of Soul, uh, the uh, Ark of the Covenant. And so they just ask, uh, we need somebody who has a fairly large hand, but no hair on the back of their hand, and you know, um, a fairly young looking hand. And uh, you know, the, the guy comes forward and he says, oh yeah, okay, put on this suit and point at this book. And, and we, many, many inserts, they're called inserts, are done like that. They just, we would find somebody that fit the physical description. You know, you're about the size of Indiana Jones, get underneath the truck and put your whip up underneath the, uh, uh, you know, when he grabs that, he grabs his whip and then he extends out the back of the truck. And that was one of the model makers. And the, the truck isn't really moving, the wind machine is blowing the dirt so it looks like, uh, it looks like it's happening. 
So there's lots of things like that. So have we seen some of your body parts that we don't know about? Uh, no, I've never, I've never lost a body part. But interestingly <laughs> enough, I one time commented to Anthony Daniels, who was the guy who was C-3PO, the guy in the gold suit. I said, uh, we were in, in front of an audience much like this, and I said, have you ever noticed that, that George Lucas always has some kind of dismemberment uh, in all of his movies? If you, if you look back, you know, it's... Uh, uh, everybody gets something chopped off. Uh, uh, Luke, Darth Vader, uh, uh, Darth Maul, um, even the C-3PO gets his, well, his head lopped off and uh, yeah. the gold guy gets lo head lopped off. But every single, oh, and the last one, of course, um, Anakin gets lopped multiple places, I guess, and uh, <clears throat> a smear vestige of his former self. But, um, yeah. Well, we're, we're going to continue on this course of destruction because uh, questions are coming in about models that you have to blow up, uh, things that you don't have a chance to remake. And, and we saw a lot in the slideshow yeah. of stuff that either had to be done in one take or you'd have to, you know, or maybe you had 12, 13, yeah. 14 models. Now, most of the time, uh, the model shop's obligation is to make it so that it could be blown up or exploded or crashed three times. But it gets very expensive to do that, of course. Uh, Excuse me. Uh, models, uh, I, I sometimes, you know, very, over various time, money means different things. So 40 years ago, it's, it means something different than it did then. So I tend to say, well, this model was like a, a Toyota Corolla, and this one was like a BMW on the low end, and this was a BMW on the high end, and this was on a Ferrari on the low end of cost. You know, and that's, that's how I kind of uh, would tell people how different models would cost. But they... You know, they always have an air system, they have a mechanical system, they have an electrical system, and a cooling system built into them. So they're a little bit like a, a custom-made car, many of the models. Not, the, not like the, uh, the pod that C-3PO uh, and R2-D2 drop out of at the very beginning of the film. That was like a, you know, a one-week wonder, I call it. I think we did that, uh, shot it one, we made it in one week, one or two weeks, and then shot it the next week. So it was a very inexpensive model. But um, the blowing up things, uh, many times the expense is just too great. Uh, an example, in Polter Poltergeist, we had the, the house that implodes. And uh, we, st we built it much like a kite. So it had very little volume, very little uh, weight, and could be drawn down in and uh, into a, uh, by wires down into a, a funnel and vacuumed. But they had asked me, so well, let's, uh, can we do it again? And I said, well, it's going to cost exactly amount, the same amount to do it over again as it did the first time. There is no benefit uh, to by doing three. And at the time, it cost as much as a, uh, a pretty inexpensive tract home way out in the valley uh, to make that. So, you know, we're talking maybe uh, by the time it gets uh, shot and everything, $100,000 or something like that to do the imploding house. Why are you not getting economies of scale? Because you figure the first time you're doing engineering that you may not have to reproduce. You're you're, uh, you know, well, it's still like uh, building a kite. Yes, you've, uh, you know how to build the kite well uh, by the second time. But everything has been crushed. And, and uh, maybe there's a few little bicycles in the garage and a lawnmower and a rug here and there that you can use. But you still got to build all the two by fours and put the drywall on it and you know construct the thing. So it, it didn't have. Uh, the economy of scale like you talked about. Uh, other times, uh, we did do three times sometimes, but I, the, the ones that really come to mind that you couldn't do three, you can see with the train crash from Back to the Future, uh, that train was probably about uh, at the top of the smokestack from the table, it was probably about this high, the body of the train about this high. And it was an expensive model to make and to take out to a quarry and, and blow off the end of the thing. And you saw the way it crashed, there'd be nothing uh, to be saved. And so it's one of those ones where we all grit our teeth and hope and make everything possible work correctly, ask everybody, is the switch ready? Is this ready? Is, you know, and do it once. And had we had to go back again to do it again, uh, it would have been uh, equally as expensive as the first time. And studios don't like to hear that, um, but you, you do have to grit your teeth a bit to make that kind of a gamble. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a money, money thing. You know, there's, a, there's an absolute joy of um, sometimes making models, sometimes pain, but a lot of joy. 
but other times uh, there's the, the tension also of trying to deliver uh, something on time and on budget can and you, the right quality. Can you remember any particular cases that come to mind where you're looking at the screen at your own work and you're saying, God, if we were only able to do that one more time, if we could have just done the model, done one more blow up, one more accident, whatever, where you would have done something a little differently? Well, there, there were a couple of times, but um, Fortunately, not our fault, my fault, and not the model shop's fault either. Um, in um, Rocketeer, you saw the big dirigible, and uh, there's, it's a long story how it happened, but the controls got mixed up. The, the a, a, B, a was put at uh, Z, and Z was put at A kind of a thing. It's a simple, and what happened is when the wires were cut, and it, it was supposed to explode, wires cut and then explode just instantaneously, but really what happened was the wires were cut, it fell from frame and then exploded and the flames came up into the scene. So that meant that that whole model had to be redone. And um, it was about 30 feet long, 25, 30 feet long. And here, the, there was an economy to it in that we had designed it using a laser cutter. We had a very large laser cutter, about uh, four foot by eight foot. And so all of the stations and everything were all in the computer. So even though the first one cost an incredible amount of money, the second one was done very quickly and, and cheaper, but not as quicker, maybe cheaper because it involved a lot more model makers. I'm not sure uh, Steve back there would know uh, about the cost of the thing, but uh, we had to redo it because it, it screwed up. You know, it just, it didn't happen. Um, you couldn't just say that was an artistic choice. Yeah, you know. it wasn't uh, the imploding house. It would have been better to shoot that one more time uh, because the exposure was a little bit off. Uh, but it's, it's very rare. And, and usually by the time uh, uh, they say wrap and you're through, you're so tired. Uh, because you, not only do you make the models, but then that person usually then travels on with a team to the stage to operate the model. So, and that involves uh, many, uh, you know, many, many 10 hour days and uh, kind of doing your stuff and then waiting, doing your stuff and then long waits, doing your stuff and long waits. So you sit in the dark on Apple boxes, waiting for the hour and a half to go by of the shot until you do your action again. So um, usually by the time a shot is done, you're, you're ready to have it done and you're out of there. What's the best model work you've done for a really bad movie? And does good work in bad movies get recognized? Hmm. Uh, maybe I wouldn't necessarily really bad, but uh, mediocre, let's say. Um, I, I'm going to start, maybe I'll show some slides here kind of behind the scenes. Uh, but uh, the film Wild Wild West uh, <laughs> was, not, was not a great film. I, the, the, the chemistry between the two actors just didn't feel like the television show. Uh, the people that loved the television show of Wild Wild West said, those weren't the characters that I would have picked at all, you know. <clears throat> so uh, I, f I felt that uh, some really in incredible work of Collapsing Monument Valley was done for that film. But, um, you know, I didn't think my time was wasted or anything like that. We, there's so many different projects to do that you, you kind of come in to one and go out of it and go on to another. Uh, they're, not all, they're not all like Star Wars and Indiana Jones films where you kind of stay on it for a year. Sometimes your, your expertise is just called upon to, for a particular sequence. Uh, let's, uh, would it be okay to uh, go a bit to slides? And, oh, yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. Here we go. Now, this is Wild Wild West. And uh, what this is is... Um, the collapse of Monument, Monument Valley. And there's a particular story point where this kind of a spidery kind of thing has to make it through this valley. And uh, so we carve these big monuments and carve this wall out of foam. It's much, it's much like surfboard foam. And the, the sand is uh, walnut, ground up walnut shells. You can buy ground up walnut shells in every possible size from uh, the size of uh, maybe eighth inch by eighth inch down to uh, just flour, you know, like, like cooking flour. So, but the trick here was that um, rocks, do, big giant rocks don't bounce. And foam rocks bounce terribly. So the trick is to figure out how to make 
uh, go to the next slide. Oh, I'm the clicker. I'm the clicker guy. Sorry. <laughs> ah, there we go. The trick, the trick was to make sure that those rocks didn't bounce. Otherwise, that would ruin the whole, the whole sequence. And the solution was to, uh, much like a bean bag, and you know how you throw a bean bag and it just plops on the ground. It doesn't bounce. So in each of the rocks, and you saw earlier in the shots, each of the rocks has a plastic uh, bottle inside with really thick motor oil with lead shot in it. And the big rocks have bigger bottles with more lead shot, and the smaller rocks have smaller plastic bottles with lead shot in them. And uh, lo and behold, those rocks did not bounce. They, uh, <laughs> and it's because the, uh, the inertia, I, I got the idea from uh, a dead blow hammer or mallet. You've all seen the big polyethylene one. Well, inside there is a chamber that has lead shot and thick oil. And, and when you hit an anvil or you hit a cement with it, it doesn't bounce. It just goes thunk. And it's because you raise it back over your head, inertia causes those little shot balls to go slowly to the back, then you whip it forward. <coughs> they can't, they're in thick oil, they can't go forward as quickly. And so they stay in the back as you're going forward, and then as you hit something, all those little lead shot travel through the oil and continue that, continue the inertia. So <coughs> it hasn't reached the stage where action, reaction, there's still more action before the reaction, the lead, uh, the lead in the oil stops that from happening. So anyway, this is what it looks like. It's much more complex than you'd ever think. Underneath there are pulleys to linear actuators that cause part of the thing to collapse like an elevator. There's explosions, there's rams that come down in the center that cause the, <coughs> the rocks to come apart, a whole bunch of stuff. And this is one of those ones that only, we could only do once. And, <coughs> excuse me, I got it. Oh, I know, water. Uh, Winter time was coming uh, in Northern California, many times the end of October starts to rain, and we knew that, and we had to speed. It had to be done for the film, <coughs> so uh, the day after this was done, uh, I could tell myself, I could tell, this is it, this is perfect, and I went home to go to sleep, uh, which you wouldn't normally do at all. I left the crew there to say, well, kind of get ready, but I think this is it, and it started to rain the next day. Or a wind picked up and we couldn't do it in the wind and then it rained and so so it was one of those critical moments and it had to work so before you leave that slide are we seeing a partial little mountain behind there on the gray a uh, partial what uh, it looks like a part of a different set behind there the gray over the, to the far the blue, left the blue gray yeah. mm -hmm. you know what that is is from the camera from the camera's point of view over here that those are hills in the distance oh gray you know, you know how hills really far away have kind of a blue-gray quality to it? It really wasn't that blue, it was more gray. And they extend over there, and they, are, they become the distant hills. And the uh, San Francisco Bay is out that direction towards uh, Richmond. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, when, when somebody noticed that and they called up the math department and said, hey, could you send somebody down here with some cardboard to paint some things? And they, a big bucket of paint, and they whoop, 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 <laughs> and had it done in no time. So uh, this is uh, Men in Black, and uh, this, when this scene happened in the theaters, uh, there were people clapping, as I remember when it first happened. It was such a dramatic shot. And the, the big technical problem here was, uh-oh, was to make the earth uh, loose enough to have a great action. I, I don't know if you'd know it, but like something like an airplane falling into the ground does not make like a 12 foot deep hole. The ground, the earth is so solid compared to an airplane which is like a, uh, an empty aluminum tube that um, <clears throat> the plane crushes but the earth does not make a big gash. Uh, a wild gas of mine, if, if it made a two foot gash that would be unusual. But that doesn't make a very exciting film. So the deal was to mix uh, vermiculite, fuller's earth, and peat moss together in a mixing, big mixing machines, and we bought hundreds of bales of this stuff to make our own special dirt. And uh, you had to make your own special uh, uh, soil in the top and grass and everything. It had to be rolled out. And uh, so this, oh, you had asked, the audience had asked, I think only about how many times we do uh, set up uh, shots. This particular one, I remember in one day we did 11 takes uh, by the time 12 o'clock came. I, I was nearly dead by the time. 
and you can see the size of it. There's a, a, a staircase and there's somebody standing over there, another ladder over here. And in the upper middle left, you can see there's a trough there. And what that is, there's a post that the ship is attached to, an aluminum post, and there's a gap all the way through it, and that model can travel through. And there's a, there's a man in a little plastic capsule that we made for him, and he has a little television monitor and a steering wheel. And he controls the ship much like an airplane, so he can make the nose go down, he can make it tilt to the right or left. And he accelerates some, like, think to 40 miles an hour. In 12 feet, he's up to 40 miles an hour, and he travels down this thing and then comes to a sudden stop, all with a linear actuator on a cables. And uh, his job is to watch the screen and, and do, you know, the right kind of mo movements. And bear, the main thing is to bury the nose into the dirt before it gets to the camera. So, and it's, it's got about, oh, 18 inches of, of dirt, uh, of this special kind of a dirt. And we had to take all the electric off every time and, and use a big roller, like a big rolling pin to, oh, and you can see the ship in the background there, a little bit of that. When you have a shot like that, is there anything happening in the shot that you haven't had a full rehearsal of? I mean, there, there must be some things that once you do them, they're done. If a piece is burning, it's going to be burnt. So how yeah. close to a real full-on dress rehearsal do you have for a shot like that? Well, some shots, like the, the train uh, uh, off the cliff, there is no dress rehearsal. There is no equivalent. And I, I don't think we've ever used the word uh, dress rehearsal. Um, but... Uh, Oh, like the imploding house, we did do segments of imploding houses. And uh, I remember um, one of the people I assigned to do this came up with a big lever to make the cables pull the house in. And even though it was built like a kite, you get that many angles and everything to it, it didn't work. You know, you had to, somebody had to pull incredibly hard or be uh, a giant muscle man. And so uh, you know, we cut to the chase and, and brought in the forklift, put a pulley into the ground, put a cable, and then <laughs> pull the, the forks on the cable on the forklift with enough muscle to make that kite go crashing down into the hole. But, <clears throat> but we did do tests. And sometimes you do tests to say, as I say, see who salutes it. You know, because you call in the cameraman, you call in the, the supervisors, and say, you know, here's our demonstration. And if they all go, oh, no, you know, that's, you know, that isn't what you want. You want everybody to go, oh, I could picture that, you know, yeah, yeah, good, good, good idea. So th this, uh, the two, there were two elements to this shot, more than two elements, but the unisphere was separate from the, the ground. And, uh, of course, computer graphics got rid of, uh, CGI got rid of the wires and all that stuff. Now, this is, uh, th yeah, I did have the crash in the running footage of Alive, and uh, this is a guy smoking up the set. And in the foreground, the, the rocks are all pieces of coal, and coal looks perfectly good scale, looks like good mountains and, and baking soda, uh, well with plaster in between to make it really, and on a steel framework to make it so it didn't vibrate. But, but this is what the rig kind of looks like. The, cameras on one, the airplanes on another, and they all run along these uh, tracks. And by the way, the, um, the mountains in the distance were a very thick aluminum foil, about 12 times thicker than um, the aluminum foil you use at home. So up that is just aluminum foil we made in big giant sheets and then crinkled it up, painted it black, and then stretched it out, and then put, threw on baking soda onto it to make it look like uh, mountains. You know, that just it just looks kind of silly when you see it, it like what? this. It looks silly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it was very, very hot, too. This was like the, you know, we're working in the snow in uh, the middle of the summertime. Uh, this also illustrates in the far right-hand corner is actually a painting. So we go from rocks, real rocks, to uh, aluminum foil to a very large painting that we did by kind of painting by numbers. You project it onto it at nighttime. We circled dark gray, light gray, uh, medium gray, black, and then came back in the daytime and painted by numbers to create a, reduplicate a photograph from the Andes. <clears throat> uh, this is uh, the walkers, the, the normal stop motion walker, as many of you might know, was about 20 inches tall. 
But this one had to explode to have its head explode off. It's when Luke wraps the cable around his legs. And so to have an explosion, you can't have a little 20-inch model. You have to make a big one. And in this case, it was a four-footer. Uh, also, there's a, there's a section of three there where this happens. There's, the cables have already been cut from the top at this time. And it's ready to fall. And sometimes things don't go right. And this picker case, whoa, whoa. <laughs> that really didn't go right. Uh, this case, <laughs> it sat, it really literally sat down like a puppy dog, and then its head blew off. <laughs> and it was supposed to, you know, fall forward, hit the ground, and then the head blows off. But, and, and uh, the, the walker in the distance is actually only 20 inches tall, and the one in the foreground is four feet tall. And it's a forced perspective with a very large painting in the background. But uh, luckily, we had other heads to uh, use, do it over and over again. This is from the, the first Indiana Jones. And uh, this was done with a kind of industrial gelatin of different colors, you know, to simulate the different layers of flesh and bones and, and uh, uh, muscle and the veins. Like that. With, with um, industrial heat guns on it to melt it very quickly, relatively quickly. Now here was, a, here was an interesting problem that um, they presented to the model shop. You know, well, come up with some kind of a ghost for us to, you know, some kind of silk thing to move around a room, uh, blow wind on it, just make these ghost elements. And everything we were trying just didn't work right. The, the wind made, no matter which way you blew the head, turned the head, the, the back end, the silk would go off in one direction. And we struggled with that for a while. Um, but we had two different ghost problems. One was this close-up of a ghost, and we used the receptionist, uh, dressed her up, uh, white makeup, and uh, put her on like a big swing in a room, uh, making her go back and forth. And then uh, one of the guys who's in the back of the room uh, came up with the idea of taking that same ghost head, a small skull head, with the silk all torn and ripped and everything, and running it on a wire underwater and it worked uh, just perfectly. It had really had that flow. It slowed the motion down, as you can imagine, trying to drag a, a beach towel through the pool or something like that. It has a, a, the tail kind of makes a nice whipping action. Worked. It was incredibly simple and uh, very effective. Now you also <clears throat> did uh, the same, a similar effect for Poltergeist with the ghosts on the stairway. And, and did any of that work carry over? Because it sounds like you found new challenges the second time. Yes, yeah, the work does carry over. You, you of course, you, just like in real life, you uh, <laughs> use uh, previous examples, successes and failures to uh, produce uh, new successes, hopefully. But um, yeah, a lot of it, a lot of it that is. And, and you know, me, just like all the, rest, the other people I worked with, we didn't know the same thing we know now that we did 40 years ago, you know, when you first started out. You, you kind of have this backlog of, uh, <clears throat> of answers. And um, I know this, uh, this uh, in my own experience, you know, uh, a lot of things after those 40 years or 35 years, people would say, you know, um, my gosh, we have somebody stepped on a bunch of gum all over our carpet in the main lobby. Why don't you go back and ask the model shop what they could do about that, you know? And then we had, <laughs> I remember I had, we had an answer, you know? And, and uh, the woman said, gosh, you know, you guys seem to know everything about that kind of stuff. And I said, well, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, things that are hard for you sometimes are easy for us and vice versa, you know? Uh, you know, if I needed computer help, I'd go forward and get some computer help, you know? But that you do have, the gum is just a silly example, but you do have a long, uh, a long history. Uh, although here's an here's a interesting story, that, a little story. Um, when we were going to do, um, oh yeah, when we were going to do Poltergeist, uh, that, back then we would sometimes sit around a table, uh, and Spielberg was one, he had come up north to, to see us, and we sat around a table with a representative from each department, and about 12 of us in a, in a circle. And Spielberg would just turn the pages, one page after another, and say, hmm, this looks like a matte painting. What do you got to say? And turn the page. This looks like an optical, you know, that, what do you say? And when we got to the imploding house, I'd, 
I remember hearing about the imploding house and seeing a picture of it, <clears throat> while they conceived of it. And uh, I, he, he's turned to me and said, well, well what are we going to do about this? And a uh, model shop. And I said, well, well, do you know how a magician makes a, a flower bouquet come out of the wand of a, a magic wand? You know, it's really a folded up tissue paper bouquet, and he goes and pops it out. And we'll just do it the opposite way. We'll take the bouquet and draw it into the wand. He says, okay, next. So it was like, he didn't want like paragraphs of an answer. He just wanted to know that somebody's got it covered, you know, that that's, uh, and he was satisfied. Yeah, I could picture that. Like a, and I hadn't really thought it out by that time, but <clears throat> that was a reasonable analogy. <clears throat> And it, uh, it, it did what it was necessary to go on to the next project, next part. Now, this was, uh, uh, again, Temple of Doom, and it's a water project, <clears throat> a water uh, effect. And uh, it was uh, probably about two Volkswagens worth of water came down this chute. And, oops, this is a bad, there. <clears throat> this is how big it is. It's inside of a very large sona tube, about the biggest they make, four foot diameter. And... As time went on, as we built this thing in greater and greater, the smaller model makers had to do, like this guy was like five foot eight and a half, and eventually we used Randy, who was about five foot one. She had to do the, uh, the stuff inside the tunnel because it got built in using uh, real rocks. And then that's what it looked like from the camera's point of view. Now, this was the mine chase. And I didn't mention it when we were watching the footage, <clears throat> but only the close-ups of uh, the, Indian, the main characters are real. The rest of it is a, is a model. So, and the characters in the, in the little uh, uh, mine cars had to be manipulated every frame by, this is Tom Sanamont, um, one of the animators. And so he would, he would move the models a little bit, then he would step away, another frame was shot. He would step in, move the models a little bit, over and over again to make the action. Uh, this is again uh, <clears throat> a time when uh, bent aluminum foil, 12, 12 times thick aluminum foil, splattered with uh, Durham's rock hard putty and paint and all that stuff. Also, somebody, uh, one of the cameramen came up with the idea uh, for that camera, which was a modified Nikon. And it's, it's one of those things, it, everything seems like the seat of your pants. You know, we were thinking, well, how somebody was had to be thinking, well, how are we going to film on the inside of there? How are we going to get the camera, a big camera, to move around inside there? And so he said, well, why don't we just mechanize the Nikon, put a big magazine on the back side, and we have electronic controls, and we'll put it on a little mine car, just like the mine car, and draw it along a wire. There's actually, if you, you could maybe see it, there's a wire right there. <clears throat> and it's uh, a steel wire that draws the thing down on two capstans, much uh, made out of a fishing reel. And so it would draw it along with the, the mine car. It was a, a very brilliant, actually I think he got a Technical Academy Award for that, because it, it has all kinds of movement, like a real camera. It, has, it moves on its nodal point, which is the, the focus point of the camera. It tilts this way and tilts that way and rotates and does a lot of stuff. But the guy got a, a Technical Academy Award for that. Now here you can you can see that aluminum foil from the back side, and and we could cut into it in certain way in certain places where we want light to come in, and it was very versatile. Also, we used um, brown paper, crinkled brown paper. I think on the left hand side is just crinkled brown paper, splattered with uh, mud like stuff. Now, if we knew what we were looking for, we know that the people obviously in the miniatures aren't real. Are there other elements when you do a miniature of a, one of the rail cars? Is there something that you just can't translate from a live one to a tiny one? And if we knew what to look for, we could see the difference between the two? Well, <clears throat> there probably are. But, you know, it's, it's, imp it's like impressionism that we're after. So to, for you, from the camera, from the step sec spectator's point of view, um, you know, we want you to believe it and all that stuff. So we certainly cheat and modify and do little, do little things. Um, I think for the most part we reproduce things exactly. And, and sometimes the best way is to make the miniature and then have them live action copy us, not the other way around. Because uh, many times the, not to denigrate the people who are making big props, but they, 
they tend to think of on a bigger scale and thicker and less super sharp and precise. And when you're making a model, uh, you can't just kind of have these roundy kind of their shapes. They have to be really defined so that they, they look like they're big. So it's better to, for us to hand uh, models to live action. As uh, an example of that was the, um, the Probot on the first Star Wars that comes shooting into the snow. Um, we built that about oh, 18, 17 inches high and then we sent it off to England for them to duplicate and um, that was a much better way. And, and in fact, we did that because the producer threatened us. He said, you know, if you guys don't finish that really quickly, I'm gonna have the, or if you don't start it really quickly, I'll have the guys in England make it first. And we like, oh, oh no, we don't <laughs> want that to happen. So <laughs> we uh, assigned a couple of people to do it. Uh, now, <clears throat> this is again the coal trick, the coal with aluminum foil with baking soda and uh, on a steel framework. Oh no, not even a steel framework this time. But the, the <clears throat> and the plane is about, oh, 30 inches in wingspan, something like that. And the trick here was that as the wheel hits the top of the mountain, it um, is supposed to hit the snow and um, you know they barely hit it. And the problem is if you take a little plane that 30 inch wingspan and light and everything and hit the snow, uh, it'll jiggle and we don't want that to happen. So we put a, a really long needle on one of the wheels on the lower end of the wheel and inside the mountain in that mound is a, a balloon about six inches in diameter and, <clears throat> and then a, a bungee cord going down inside of a tube about a, oh, a four inch diameter tube so that when the plane hits the, the needle hits the balloon in the snow because it's covered with snow it'll explode, but all the balloon and everything else will go zooming down on the inside of the mountain. So you won't have the balloon flying into the shot. So, so the plane's like that, and that's, that's what it looks like after the plane has exploded the balloon, and you can see it, it blew the, the, the snow into the air, but you didn't have pieces of balloon flying into the air. <clears throat> and the plane didn't jiggle, and uh, I, I don't, you might be able to see the wires in this shot, but I'm not sure, but the plane runs down on wires. This is on top of the roof uh, of the building, one of the buildings that we, we many times did uh, on top of the roof, hoisted everything up there. And <clears throat> now here's a, this was a problem for uh, Phantom Menace, and the way George Lucas conceived uh, C-3PO was that he was created by Anakin uh, when he was a boy. He was a, a brilliant kid, I guess, you know. So he figured out, well, it had to be semi-transparent because he isn't really through it. doesn't have all of its skin parts on it. And um, so that presented a problem, especially for Anthony Daniels, who was the guy that was supposed to be inside the suit. He thought he was going to be cut out of the picture. Uh, major disappointment there. So we, uh, the art director, Doug Chang, drew up this drawing. And... Uh, it was, it was one of those toss-ups above CG and model. Who will do that shot? And sometimes it comes down to who's, who's busy, who's free to do it. You know, if CG computer graphics at the time was totally booked up, they'd say, eh, you know, we're booked up. Uh, does someone else have an idea? And the model shop pursued this. <clears throat> and what we did was there's a, a type of Japanese uh, puppet show called a Bunraku Puppets, and they're half-scale puppets that do the kabuki play and the people who operate them are called shadow men and they wear these big black things with a little eye slot with a screen and you're supposed to ignore the fact that there's a shadow men on the ground operating the rod puppets so uh, this guy Mike Michael conceived it uh, as more of a full-scale model but it's all attached to his feet you know it's attached to his arms attached to his chest to his head and this was one of those things that he made this thing relatively quickly and asked, you know, to come, or people come and look at it and see if somebody would salute it. And uh, the supervisors the, uh, of the show saw it and they went, yeah, I, I guess, yeah, that could work. That's interesting. <clears throat> so then the model shop embarked upon making that C-3PO. And, uh, and you can see in this case, the operator behind it is in a green suit against a green screen. And uh, so he would disappear as far as the camera is concerned. So now C-3PO can walk and, and you can still see through him. And I think that's it. 
It's, 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 it's actually never it as far as visuals are concerned. Since <laughs> we did almost 200 films, we could be here till uh, early in the morning uh, seeing the slides. So not that many would stay that late. But <laughs> We've got a couple more questions okay. to whip through. And um, I'm sorry I'm not going to get to all of them, obviously, but we'll get to as many by as By the way, I, I lost a lot of my hearing, and so that's why I like, like Actually, that. we're bonding. Yeah, we're bonding. <laughs> <clears throat> Were you involved in the scene from Jedi where the scout walker is crushed between two large logs on ropes? Oh, can, yeah. Yeah. Can you talk about the challenges there? <clears throat> yeah. The, um, it's the, uh, the Ewoks cut loose the ropes and the big, uh, the big oh, two and a half inch diameter logs come and crush the head of what we call the chicken walker. And <clears throat> the, the, difficult, the problem to be solved there is that if you made the head out of plastic like we would normally do, you know, plastic has this memory to it and it bounces and, you know, uh, try to throw down a plastic uh, Coke bottle, big Coke bottle, you know, and it boom, bounces and things, it doesn't really smash, you know, you, you have to throw it really hard to get a hole in it or dent in it. <clears throat> so uh, I, I went back to uh, some old experience of mine, even before I was working on Star Wars, Believe it or not, uh, one of my jobs at an industrial design company was to make the original pattern for motorcycle helmets. To, when they first started having helmets with a jaw on the front, and you don't think that that would happen these days, it wouldn't happen this way, but I would sculpt them, you know, and I had rigs and, you know, it up and a thing, and every day I would like, you know, feel it and think, oh, it's a little bit leap, a little bit more material on this side, a little bondo week after week of trying to get the thing perfect, because then I would work for a week, they'd come in and judge it, you know, and they'd, they'd say, oh, yeah, it should be a little fuller back here. And a little more. But anyway, the a process we did to make those motorcycle helmets is we took the sculpture that I did and then put a special silver coating on it and then plated nickel on it so the nickel was over an eighth of an inch thick. So that, and then that was buffed out and polished, and that would be the pattern for the people who manufactured the helmet somewhere. <clears throat> and so I remembered, ooh, you know, if you only plated the nickel very, very thin, it would be like a tin can. So that's what we did. We made that head in plastic, and then we took it down to this company in LA that uh, I knew that did the nickel plating, and they plated it with just enough nickel to be like a, a thin tin can, <clears throat> and then we used acetone to eat away the plastic on the inside. So we had multiples of those that could do it, but we knew that <clears throat> when those logs came and they were loaded with lead, they would crush it like a can, but also on the inside we actually had the two pilots. Uh, they never did show up in the film, but we had a light, we had you know all kinds of things on the inside of the thing, just in case it split open like a, you know, burst open. But uh, that was how we did that, uh, quite a, it was quite an effective shot. And that chicken walker was probably about a little bit under three feet tall is how tall it was. It was a very f fun, fun shot, <clears throat> yeah. Can you describe a spectacular failure that you've experienced in your work? Uh, uh, what kind of failure? A spectacular oh, failure. Spectacular <laughs> failure. Well, it, it, it actually sounds kind of funny, but there weren't that many of them. And um, um, uh, part of that is is that that thing of you know gritting your teeth and knowing that you know twenty thousand thirty thousand dollars is on the line. Um, you know you can't just kind of shrug your shoulders and come back to work the next day after you've wasted fifty thousand dollars. So, um, but uh, you know that the, the dirigible falling uh, it was a very expensive model, and uh, it gave everybody real pause for thought uh, about what that, what that meant. But fortunately, it was not the model shop's fault, so it was somebody else's fault. Can we look ahead to new Star Wars movies? Well, uh, for sure. They, uh, Disney uh, now has the rights to Star Wars, and they're madly working away. Um, you know, I personally uh, was called in to consult really early on, but it, really what it meant was going through the archives where all the models were. And uh, since 
I'd worked on all of them. Uh, you know, they, I could say this is this and that's that, and this is right and that's wrong, and you know that that that's what they wanted. They wanted to just take the crew or the the art director, the uh, production designer, and the director, and all the producer and all that kind of stuff, and kind of do a refresher course in models. But uh, I'm certainly not privy to uh, exactly what they're going to do. Uh, I read on the computer just like you do, uh, little tidbits here and there, but. Uh, you know, I haven't, I haven't really heard of sets being built. I've heard of a rumor that a large Millennium Falcon is being built, but, but I also know from the past that uh, there's a rumor mill. Publicists are paid to put out rumors that become free publicity. And uh, I remember I was telling somebody here that it was something like four years before uh, the last Indiana Jones happened, they were talking about you know, the Indiana Jones this and Indiana Jones that, and it never happened. It never, you know, they're going to shoot this, they're going to shoot that. And I knew that all they were doing was fishing for free publicity is what they were doing. So, So if there I were a know. new Millennium Falcon coming, you'd know at some point because you'd have to start working on miniatures and, and uh, models. <clears throat> you know, I, I personally have retired. I wouldn't be working on miniatures. I thought uh, you still had the inside track. <laughs> well, the, the, the thing on the computer that I heard was that possibly, maybe, somewhere in England, they are building a full-size or, or four-fifths scale Millennium Falcon. But uh, it's not that they've shown photographs or anything, and you, know, you take it with a grain of salt. You don't know, is it true, or is that just a rumor that somebody started? You know, but I, I don't know. And there's always some rumors about that they will use models on this next uh, film, and then there's other rumors that they won't, you know. And um, they are setting up a model, another model shop in, uh, in England, but then when the director comes back to California, will they then use the old model shop, which is now called uh, 3210 in, in Northern California. <laughs> we are in Northern California. Sometimes I'm, sometimes I'm different places, you know. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, come up north to Marin and do some more model work there, which everybody is hopeful there. But uh, you know, they're not going to call me up and let me know what's happening. Thank and you. This has just been wonderful. This has just oh, been good. great. Good. You know, and thank you for making it so breezy and oh, easy and all not that a stuff. Problem. But do I understand you've got a few minutes to meet and greet, not a great deal of time, but yeah. okay, great. He'll be here for you to come up and say hi if you like. I th myself, I think this was a, a shorty, you know. <laughs> but <laughs> I heard you've gone on for four hours. Yeah, how, how long is, is it we've been at it? We've been doing this for about an hour and 20 minutes. Oh, okay. Which is usually well, we that's round good. it up. So. Yeah, time goes pretty, pretty quick. Thank and you it, for coming. Uh,